Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 215, which reads as follows. Kamato jayati soko. Kamato jayati bhayang. Kamato vipamutasa nati soko kuto bhayang. Which means from desire comes sorrow, from desire comes danger. When one is freed from desire, there is no sorrow. From where can there be danger? And this verse was taught in response to the story of Anitigandha. Anitigandha mean Anitigandha is a name. I'm not sure if it was really his name, but it means one who who doesn't have a who doesn't have a smell for women. I think. I think it's it's possibly some kind of colloquialism from ancient India, like we would say when someone has a taste for something. That's only a guess, but it's based on the story. Because Anita Ganda, Ganda means smell, and Iti means woman. An is no or not, one who doesn't have. Aniti Ganda was uh, a man who lived in Sawati, but in past life he had been a Brahma, a god, a, a being that lives in a realm without sensuality. So it means in some far and distant time in the past, he had developed high states of concentration and absorption and been reborn in, in, in these great, profound, deep realms of existence and had lived there for uh, lengths of time that end up seeming very much like eternity. But they aren't, of course, eternity, and so with the ending of those states of existence, one is reborn, and he was reborn as a young man. He was born as a baby, grew up as a human, and as a young man, uh, from birth, wanted to have nothing to do with women. And hence he got this, this name. When, whenever a woman came close to him, he would scream, he would wail. When they tried to breastfeed him, they had to, uh, they had to sort of cover themselves up, and 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 expose only their their breasts so that he couldn't see the woman. Now I'm not sure how. Again, it's just a story, but the the it's quite possible. But the 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 emphasis here is on the fact that his. His life in the Brahma world uh, left him with no, sen no sense of attachment to, to women. And it may be that, uh, I mean, this is what the story says, that he actually had a strong aversion to them. But the, the point is that he had no desire for, for women. And so his parents tried to find, uh, tried to encourage him to get married. And so they would ask him, son, son, you know, please, we, we want you to carry on our lineage, have children, become a householder. When are you going to get married? When are you going to go find a woman? 
they tried they knew that he had this aversion to women and they pushed him and pushed him and finally he got fed up with it and he 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 built a statue he, he created a statue of a woman a replica of the most beautiful woman and he, she was just this this statue was the perfect figure of a woman and so when his parents came and said son son when are you going to find a wife he said look and he showed them the statue and he said if you can find me a woman as beautiful as that then I will get married I will marry her so I, I imagine some of the aversion it probably wasn't that he was homosexual it probably was just again his his life in the in the Brahma realms d caused him to break away from the ordinary attachment to sensuality that most people find themselves stuck in. And so he was able to see the, the flaws, I would say, in the human body. And so while everyone else was raving about the beauty, all he saw was the ugliness. And so he... He, hearing of this beauty, he created this statue and he said, Look, there is no beauty that I see here, but if you find this beauty, something that is actually beautiful, this perfect woman, then I will marry her. So the parents said, Okay, well, there's got to be someone in the world that beautiful. He, our son is, is, is a very meritorious sort of person. He clearly has some strong qualities of good karma so there's got to be someone out there who has uh, the same level as him and perhaps has some connection with him from past lives and so they took this statue in a cart and they traveled around the countryside looking for such a woman there happens to have been such a woman in uh, a city called Sagara I think and so they brought this this statue there and when they went to the bathing place this woman came and saw her and said what are you doing out here she had just bathed this there was this young uh, woman living on the top floor of a seven-story mansion there's this sort of uh, stereotype, or I guess it's an ancient tradition perhaps of keeping women, young daughters, secluded. And I think it's sort of the ideal of the perfect maiden, the perfect virgin, virgin, having no contact with men, having never had contact with men, so she would be kept up in a, in a tower. I think we hear about such stories like Rapunzel and so on. Anyway. And uh, she had just bathed this, 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 this was the maid of the house, the, the, the nursemaid or so on. She had just bathed her, her care, the, the daughter, and then went down and went out to the water hole or wherever. And she, said, and she saw this statue and she said, what are you doing out here? I just bathed you. And now you're out and about. And she struck the girl, I don't know, hit her or whatever. And, and realized it was just a statue and said, what's this doing here? And the, the men who, who had been tasked to carry this around came and said, what are you doing? Why do you have a statue of my daughter? My, my, it's not my daughter, my, my charge. And they said, your daughter looks like this, your charge looks like this. And she said, well, to be honest, that has nothing on, on my mistress. She is far more beautiful than that. And they said, oh, please, can you take us to her? And they went and they saw this girl. And indeed, she was the most beautiful girl in the realm. And so they traveled back. They, they talked with them about their plans and they traveled back. And the young man, they told the young man and the parents about this, this woman. And Anitiganda became suddenly desire arose in him that had never arisen before 
Suddenly this desire that he had never felt when he looked at another woman, when he looked at, at other women, suddenly it arose in him, this desire. And he was anticipating, always asking, when is she coming? And they sent a message that she should come in a carriage, but she was so fragile and they had kept her so secluded that the story says quite matter-of-factly that she died along the way. She fell ill and died while she was traveling because the travel was just too, too, too hard for her. As simple as that. And Aniti Ganda was kept asking, when is she coming? Is she coming today? And the parents tried to stall him, but eventually they had to let him go. Let him know that, uh, unfortunately, she was so close to being united in heavenly matrimony or whatever, and yet she died along the way. And Aniti Ganda became very sad and locked himself in his room, I guess, and. The Buddha found out about this and came for breakfast for, for food one day and they fed the Buddha and the Buddha asked them, where is Aniti Ganda? And they said, oh, he's, he's up in his room. And so they called him down and the Buddha said, what's wrong? And he explained to the Buddha what's wrong and the Buddha said, oh, Aniti Ganda, do you know why you are so sad? Do you know where this sadness comes from? And he said, you know, you tell me where, where it comes from. And the Buddha said, it comes from desire. And then he taught this verse. So there's a couple of things about this verse, about this, this story and this verse. The first is, of course, the obvious lesson that it gives us another facet, another angle uh, in, in the story, in the the on the topic of desire, on the topic of suffering coming from desire. So we've talked about how the striving and the, the fighting over objects of desire can lead to suffering. We've talked about how the loss of objects of desire. Here we have the, the uh, inability to obtain the object of desire, which is again a common theme in, in life. People whose ambitions are unfulfilled, whose wishes are unfulfilled, whose love is unrequited. And we see that in, in the build-up, in the anticipation, this cultivation of desire, you know, day after day where Aniti Ganda is sitting at home, building, you know, day after day this anticipation and stoking up his desire to a fevered pitch until it is finally crushed. I've heard, uh, I've talked with people who, who end up quite depressed and quite obsessed with something in the past where they feel was really their chance at happiness. And they get so stuck on that that they're unable to, to free themselves from the cycle of depression. They feel hopeless and helpless because, of course, with the past you can't change it. And the more f your, your key to success gets stuck in the past, the more desperate your situation becomes, the harder it becomes to, to free yourself. So in all, we've looked at many aspects and... and uh, it really is a good sort of multifaceted lesson in how desire leads to suffering. You know, when we when we look at all these facets and when we look at all the ways in which we could suffer based on what appears to be the cause of happiness, which is obtaining the objects of your desire. We look at all the ways that we do suffer in life based on them. We come to see that it's not it's not insignificant for us to say that it is fraught with sorrow and, and danger. Hmm. But the other lesson is a little less obvious, but also quite important and profound, and that is how divested from reality, if that's the correct use of the term, 
uh, our perceptions of desire are. We think we desire people and um, experiences, I guess, like a state of being married, of being um, romantically involved, e experiences like sex and uh, cuddling and so on, um, interactions with other people. You know, we think that these are the things that we, are, we desire. We think that we are desiring uh, the beautiful shape, the, the sight, the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste, the feeling. We think our desire is something, you know, we, we make some some idea of desire that is far more um, complicated, complex, and perhaps even far more convincing than the reality. Convincing in the sense that it's easy to make a narrative out of uh, a love affair, right? It's easy to make a, this story, if not given in a Buddhist context, would be a great tragedy. In a Buddhist context, it's a great victory in the sense for this, not for the woman, but for the man, in the sense that uh, he's come to realize that not only A, was he... Uh, still very much susceptible to desire but also that the desire was on a deeper level than the aversion that he had towards ugliness and the, the danger in, in desire was was the and the, the, of course the potential for loss the potential for lack of, of, of obtaining and so on But the, the reality is that we don't crave for any of these things. All of these narratives and stories and, and ideas we have of desire, they mask what's the real truth. And that is that desire is really, in some sense, much more similar to a drug addiction our desire for any kind of sensuality. And you can see this in, in this story. He, he had never seen this woman. He had a, a, a statue that was supposed to look like her, but it's quite r remarkable that his desire became so strong. Not that this is surprising, but because it's the sort of thing that we can probably identify with. We, we anticipate. You know, we build up this idea in our minds that is, that is has nothing to do with the actual liking of, of what we're seeing. Right? We say that it's this thing that we see that we want, but he's never even seen this woman. What he was anticipating was the pleasure that he would get from seeing her. And in fact, probably during the time that he was anticipating uh, seeing her, he was actually already engaging in the drug addiction because his mind was producing the chemicals. As long as you can build this narrative up of beauty and of pleasure, you can feel the, the great pleasure that comes along with addiction, even without getting what you want. And so the pleasure had nothing to do at that point with seeing or, or, or encountering this woman. It had to do with him triggering the feelings of pleasure in his, in his brain, really. The brain chemicals that we become addicted to. Our desires are, are, are not related to what we think of as the objects of our desire. 
they're related in a secondary sense in terms of being a catalyst so we 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 being unable to manu manufacture these chemicals directly we trigger them through this uh, system of habits where in the past we've experienced pleasure through these things so when we see them we're able to give rise to the feeling of pleasure in the mind when heterosexual men see women they they become yeah, they, give, they they it triggers something in the in the brain and they're able to experience this pleasure when homosexual men see men they they handsome men they become or the the sign of the man in the body they become they, they likewise give rise to this trigger we would say in buddhism based on habits from, from past lives when dogs see other dogs and they get the sign of a dog they become uh, intoxicated the desire arises in the mind and the pleasure arises and so this is a big part of why mindfulness is so powerful in helping us overcome not just desire but aversion and all types of problems that are removed from reality because mindfulness is focusing on what's really happening it's focusing on the, the very building blocks of the experience it's showing us or it's allowing us to see what's happening when you see something that you like. That it's not the thing that you like, it's actually the feeling of pleasure that arises, that you're able to give rise to. You know, if it was the thing that brought us pleasure, then looking at it incessantly would always bring us pleasure, but we see that that's also not the case. And this is why often it's very difficult for romantic partners to stay um, to stay faithful it's one of the reasons because they become attracted to something else because of course the the brain is the way it works it's very hard for the same object to give rise to the same to, to ple the same amount of pleasure and so you need something new something exciting it has to be something that actually is able to turn the switch on the mind becomes in a sense um, uh, worn, worn away. No, it's not exactly, but it becomes. A, it's like a, a belt in your car that becomes stretched and it no longer works. And so it, it's like the mind gets tired of the same old thing. It's like this is why we feel we get bored of the same old thing. And so something that you used to look at and be quite excited by and turned on by, and therefore pleased by, no longer gives you that pleasure, and so you have to look elsewhere. That's why drug addicts, addiction becomes worse and worse because the same amount of, of the drug can't give you the same amount of pleasure. When we see it with music, why we have to... If music was so pleasant, why couldn't we listen to the same song? Ah, that's not how it works. You can't listen to the same song for hours and hours and days on end. You can, but the pleasure won't be the same as the first time. And so you have to vary it, go back and forth. And, and you learn, we learn to work with the mind to get as much pleasure as we can by uh, switching objects. But that's the reality of it, and that's what mindfulness allows us to see. That's still not, a, not an easy thing to deal with, because these addictions are real. But the point is that we have to recognize, if we want to, to be honest, we have to recognize that our Desires don't come from people and places and things. They come really from just drug addictions to the brain chemicals that bring us pleasure. You know, being stimulated in various parts of the body or in any of the various senses gives rise to brain chemicals that are very difficult and, and challenging to overcome. And mindfulness isn't able immediately to do away with these. So a big part of our practice has to be patience. But a very important first step is being able to see that that's actually the truth and not simply turning them off, but becoming aware of them. Becoming aware that it's not this romantic or, or high-minded 
the narrative or story of, of a love affair and so on. It's merely a drug addiction. Drug addiction with its many sorrows, not getting what you want, losing what you like, having to compete for what you want and so on, and all the stories that we've heard in this chapter. So with mindfulness we we cut straight to the reality. All of those stories have no meaning. We see, seeing is just seeing, hearing. When you say to yourself seeing, seeing, you're able to experience the seeing just as seeing. And it, it doesn't um, excite in the same way as before. When you have the desire and the pleasure, you're able to see that those are actually what the mind is fixating on. Whatever can give it that pleasure in the brain and in the mind. That's what it aims for. And, uh, and then you're able to focus on those and not turn them off, but slowly, slowly attenuate them. Attenuate them mainly by seeing. The, 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 the main and the deepest part of the path is by seeing them just for what they are. And the importance there is that what they are is just an experience, that actually pleasure and this is on a deeper level than any of these stories. Pleasure is just pleasure. There's nothing good, nothing bad about it. But there's desire and attachment. The liking of the pleasure also has no basis in reality. There's nothing intrinsically likable, lovable, desirable about pleasure. Just like there's nothing intrinsically um, undesirable about pain. And being able to see through these is very powerful. It's what allows us to find real peace of mind. It's why a meditator, someone who has even practiced the way this young man had practiced, can find great states of peace and calm simply by extracting themselves from that process of addiction. Now, as we could see in another lesson in the story, is that simply extracting yourself from it doesn't, it doesn't uh, last forever doesn't solve the problem because eventually when you get in contact with it something really really enticing then you become attached again but we can see that from our, from meditation from mindfulness from mindfulness practice that by observing it by facing it just like facing pain by confronting the pleasure we come to see that there's nothing special about it not in the way we thought there's certainly none of this narrative about falling in love and finding the girl or the boy or the person of your dreams. They're simply drugs and addiction. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening. I wish you all the best.